LA. There are roughly 260 homes occupying around 650 people. Now originally, people could live willy-nilly all throughout the islands and tending was a popular choice. Now in the early 1900s, they were restricted to east ends. Now in the 1930s, the Toronto Council allowed the many campers to build permanent homes, firstly on Wharf and eventually Algonquin. And by the time World War II ended, no campsites were permitted. In the 1950s, the Toronto Council began converting the islands into city-owned parkland, demolishing the homes and uprooting the community. Now, the remaining residents protested this upheaval for about 20 years until the Toronto Islands Residential Community Trust was established in 1993. This trust procured 99 leases for those remaining residents, securing the community until the year 2092. Now, in securing these leases, it's created a rather interesting real estate market that is very different from the mainland. So all housing sales are made by that trust, and the houses tend to be a lot cheaper than similar houses on the mainland. The reason for the inexpensiveness is houses are based on the original cost of the home, minus any depreciation for wear and tear. So the prices are fixed and are non-negotiable. Now with every deal that seems too good to be true, there is a slight catch. So that trust I mentioned earlier maintains a list known as the purchase list. So it's a list of up to 500 people, and it's only these people that are ever able to make an offer on an island home. Now for those just wanting to get on that list, good luck, and that is not easy either. The last time that list was open to new applicants was back in 2013, in which nearly 300 people applied for the available 32 slots. So the way that list works is that if the house becomes available, the person at the top of the list gets a choice whether to buy or pass because that price is fixed. And if they pass, it becomes better for the next person, and so on. So the, the two or three houses that become available each year are typically bought by those in the top 100. So if the current rate of sales continues, it would take around 167 to 250 years for all currently on that list to get a home. Now if you're lucky enough to bypass that so far, and you manage to find yourself with a home, there are still a couple of rules you do have to live by. So firstly, it has to be your primary residence which means you cannot rent it out to other people and you do have to live there all year round. So it does include the Canadian winters here. And that's why I mentioned earlier that they had to send icebreakers there every morning because these island islands are still used by the residents. Now the second rule you have to obey is if you are sick of island life and wanted to move back to the mainland and you are hoping to pass the house on to either your favourite child or grandchild, that is also not allowed. So as soon as you pass on, you want to pass it on, the house goes back to the city and becomes available for the next person patiently waiting on that list. So it seems like a lot of admin, but if you wake up with a view like this every morning, I think it'd be slightly worth it. Now most of the mainland waterfront in front of us was once heavily industrialised with numerous factories and manufacturing plants, hence one of Toronto's nicknames, the Big Smoke. Now in the 1970s, Toronto started to redevelop the waterfront to make it a more desirable and relaxing place to be. Now in the early 2000s, the Toronto Waterfront Vitalization Corporation was established and they helped turn the waterfront into what we see today. So most of this land is now owned by the Harbour Fund Centre, which is a non-profit organisation. Now this facility consists of two main marinas, numerous art galleries, stages, theatres and restaurants. So with around 4,000 events each and every year, mostly for free, I definitely recommend checking them out while you are here. Now it's not a proper Toronto tour without talking about the CN Tower ahead of us. Now that CN Tower was built by the Canadian National Railway as a telecommunications tower in 1976 at a total cost of $63 million. Now in addition to its broadcasting duties, it also plays as a great tourist attraction. Now that 58 second lift ride got even more exciting in 2008 when one of the lifts was fitted with a glass floor and is now the world's highest clear bottom uh, floor. Now if you guys look at the very top of the CN Tower, the, the, the highest room, there's actually, you'll see these bright red figures. So they're actually people doing the edge walk. Now a fun fact about that is that the most common demographic age group for doing that is between 18 to 25, which is uh, expected. However, the second most common group is actually women over 80. So we have no excuses not to do it, but I'd like to prefer washing it down from here. But, yeah, no excuses. 
So basically you're um, shaped into a big harness and you can overhang from the CN Tower. So I like my feet on the ground. <laughs> Now the Rogers Centre there next to the CN Tower. So it is the home of our Toronto Blue Jays and was the former home of the Toronto Raptors. It was the first stadium in North America to have a fully working retractable roof after Montreal's Olympic Stadium turned out to be a failure. It was also the most expensive stadium built when finished in 1989 at a total cost of $570 million. So it makes it quite tragic that it was sold to Rogers Communications for a paltry $25 million.